right, in this lesson, uh, we're going to get a little bit more involved and a little more in depth with the, uh, in terms of heat emitters, in terms of hydronic uh, heating systems. In a previous lesson, I, we, we talked about it a little bit, but in this one, we're going to kind of get a little bit more in depth with it. So what we already should know about a hydronic system is that we have heat emitters. Okay, your heat emitters in a hydronic system are what actually releases the heat from the system's fluid into the space that's being heated. Okay, so baseboard, your steam radiators, those are all technical terms as a heat emitter. Okay, our heat emitters, they can range from just little small, little toe kick heaters, panel heaters, um, to entire floor uh, areas of a building as a heat transfer surface. Think about radiant heat, uh, radiant floors, radiant walls. Uh, those are all heat emitters. Okay, the design of the system it must be selected in size the heat emitters for the given application. So with heat emitters, we have to make sure that we understand uh, the technical aspects of them. We honestly should probably think about architectural aspects of them. Um, you know, some people are just very picky when it comes to, you know, the way their home looks and the overall design of, you know, of the home, and obviously your economic issues. These are all very important parts of the aspect of all of this and when we're considering what type of heat emitter baseboard that we're going to put in. Some other technical types of issues that we deal with is obviously the temperature, temperature rise, that we're trying to maybe achieve for okay for like example uh, your hot water domestic hot water heating uh, you have to deal with flow rates uh, we don't want the water to be going too fast in the pipes because that will just obviously create noise and other issues that can honestly be a little bit of a nuisance to, to the homeowner especially if they got to deal with it every single day uh, and then obviously your heat output rates. We got to make sure that these baseboards are sized correctly and we're putting out the correct amount of heat to the space so that we can create a comfortable environment. Some architectural issues that we have to adjust uh, is the appearance of your heat emitters, uh, any interference that may create with uh, furniture, door swings, all that sort of stuff. So you know, some design, a little bit of creativity in some ways have to be kind of brought to light a little bit when it comes to designing and putting in a baseboard hydronic heating system. Uh, economic considerations can greatly expand or restrict your heat emitter uh, selections, options, and all that stuff for some customers. Again, obviously, it comes down to money. Uh, some people may not necessarily be able to afford that more high-end, uh, you know, design-type heat emitter. They just might be able just to afford your basic, you know, thin and, co thin and copper baseboard, okay? Uh, most heating systems are designed after the floor plan of the building has been developed. The uh, reason why they have to do that is obviously because we need to know where your interior or exterior walls are going to be. We need to know where windows are going to be. Uh, we need to know the type of flooring that's going to be used, carpet, is it hardwood, so on and so forth, so that we know exactly where we can and cannot put our radiators once we start putting them in. Uh, some heat emitters directly heat the air in the room. Uh, they are commonly called convectors because convective heat transfer is the primary means the heat is actually released. 
You have other heat emitters that release a majority of their heat by thermal radiation and can commonly be called radiators. There are several types of heat emitters that you're going to run to in the HVAC hydronic heating industry. You have your fin tubed baseboard convectors, you have your fan coil convectors, panel radiators, and other hydronic heat, emitted, heat emitters. Okay. Sometimes special names are given for some certain types of heat emitters, such as your kick space heater, or better known as your toe kick heater. Uh, a kick space heater is a heater that is a small horizontal fan coil designed to mount under a cabinet or stair thread or wherever it may happen to be. A towel warmer is a name for a certain style of panel radiator. So here you go. Here's a kick space heater right here. Okay, I'm pretty sure people have those in some of their houses. If not, you probably have seen them somewhere. Uh, they are very common. You do find them in a lot of bathrooms. You do find them in uh, kitchens where obviously, you know, you got your stove and your sink and your cabinets all along an exterior wall. So in order to kind of get some heat into there, we usually will throw in a toe kick heater, which will be just mounted right underneath the cabinets, and it will throw the heat right along the floor to kind of just give a little bit of heat in that in that room. Okay, then you got your little nice hydronic towel warmers. Okay, those are kind of uh, classified as your radiant heaters okay obviously you know what they're used for because when people get out of their shower they want to have a nice toasty warm towel when they get out so that they're not cold uh, but that's what that is also a, a heater okay how these are basically working is that you'll have actually a water line a supply line uh, here and here and it basically just radiates along the towel the towel racks and it heats up the towels. Uh, the most common hydronic heat emitter used in residential and light commercial systems is the fin tubed baseboard convector. Uh, it consists of a sheet metal enclosure containing a copper um, fitted tube with aluminum fins. Okay, the fin tubed is called the element of the baseboard since it is the component that actually readily releases the heat. Okay, so I'm pretty sure a lot of people have seen these before. Okay, so basically how this actually works. You have your copper tube, okay, your water, your hot water will be running through the copper tube all the way along and then back to the boiler so that it's a constant heating loop. And as that hot water passes through this copper, that heat is then transferred to the aluminum fins. The aluminum fins begin to heat up all the way down. Okay, and as that happens, we start to have a thermal layering and thermal convection where we actually now start to experience the laws of thermal dynamics. Whereas that warm air uh, starts to get heated, it starts to rise out of the top of our, our baseboard, which will now then circulate through the home and through the space, and as it cools off, it starts to drop. As it drops, it starts to get kind of almost sort of like sucked back in to the baseboard, where it passes along the aluminum fins again, where it again is then heated up, and then it's passed back out again. This action will continue until the room is up to temperature and the thermostat has actually satisfied. Okay, as we are kind of seeing in this diagram here, cold air will drop, it will get forced in through the baseboard, it gets heated up, and then right back out. And that cycle just continues to happen until the room satisfies and the thermostat is open. So fin tube baseboard, uh, used in residential and light commercial applications usually have an element consisting of either about a half inch or three quarter inch copper with rectangular aluminum fins about two and a quarter to about two and a half inches wide and high 
Uh, the enclosures are fabricated with steel sheets or, uh, and vary from about six to eight inches in height. Uh, they are usually sold in lengths of anywhere between two feet and about ten feet. Uh, larger style elements are available for commercial application and usually have a element consisting of either copper or steel in the size of three quarter or one and a quarter inches. Uh, the fins are also larger and are usually of aluminum or steel. Uh, the, ba the operation of your fin tube baseboard is relatively simple. Uh, the hot air rises due to its lower density and air comes in contact with the fin tube elements is heated by natural convection. It rises through the fins and up through the slots at the top of the enclosure and the cool air near the floor is then drawn through the slots at the bottom of the enclosure. Okay, most baseboard enclosures have hinged dampers over the outlet slots. Okay, this damper can be manually set to limit airflow through the baseboard. Uh, when it's fully closed, the heat output is reduced by 40 to about 50 percent. Uh, the outward flow of air can negate the effects of downward drafts from exterior walls and windows and is usually installed under your windows. Okay. Usually when you look at a home, or the next time you're actually in a home or in your own home, take a look at where your baseboard is actually located. You have a probably 80%, 90% chance that your baseboard is going to be all installed along the exterior walls, usually underneath your windows and, and, and usually around where your doors are. All right, the reason why is because where is most of the cold air going to penetrate a home? It's going to be through the exterior walls and windows. So by having a, a heat source or a baseboard heat source there, you are now kind of creating what like a heat curtain. Okay? You're you're preventing some of that cold air from entering the space. Okay, so when it calls to installing your baseboard, uh, you got four basic steps when it comes to installing it. Well, first, you have to drill holes for your riser pipes, the pipes that are going to go through the floor. Then you're going to attach the enclosure to the walls. Then you're actually going to install your fin tube elements, and then you're going to put the front cover and trims on. Okay, so... The holes for the riser pipe should be located so as to avoid drilling into your floor joists, girders, wiring, or obviously any other plumbing that might be underneath the floor. So before you start drilling holes through someone's floor, you might want to go downstairs into that basement or what have you and make sure that you have a clear path and you're not going to be cutting wires or drilling a, a hole through someone's water line because that would really make for a bad day. One approach is to locate a nearby object that penetrates through the floor, measure the location of the joist to this object, and then transfer these measurements above the floor to locate that joist. Another method is to drill a small eighth inch hole and insert a guide wire or something uh, to help locate the hole in the floor. Uh, the pipes, the holes for the riser pipes to the fin tube element should be about a half inch larger than the nominal size of the pipe being used because obviously what you're trying to do here is you're trying to provide a space for the pipe to expand when heated without stressing the pipe. Okay, and the discussion plate can be installed on the riser pipe to neatly cover the hole through the floor. Okay, and this is what the escutcheon plate actually looks like. So once you, before you start putting on your baseboard, you're going to stick this plate right over that hole that you just drilled, and all you'll see is the copper pipe sticking out of the floor. The bottom of the enclosure should be installed 
at least one inch above the subfloor. And this allows for clearance for medium thickness carpeting or pads, so on and so forth. And then to enclose, the enclosure is usually screwed or nailed to the wall. On wood frame walls, the enclosure should be fashioned at intervals not exceeding 32 inches or basically every other stud uh, on a typical wall is where you're actually going to screw the enclosure to the wall. Once the enclosure is actually secured, the fin tube assembly can be placed on the cradles of the enclosure and then soldered together. Okay, in some installations, the supply and return piping must exit the same end of the baseboard. This is usually uh, used when one end of the baseboard cannot be accessed through the floor. Okay, and when that is happening, you're going to use this fitting here. Uh, at that fitting here, you would actually install an air vent or a high vent right here so that you can eliminate any sort of air that might be in the baseboard right here. So your supply, your baseboard would be connected right here. And then your return line will be connected right here, which will now go back. Okay, sort of like this, as you see here. Okay, to complete the installation, all you're going to do is snap the front cover in place and install the necessary trim pieces. Okay, thermal ratings and performance of all of your fin tube baseboards. The heat output of fin tube baseboards is expressed in BTUs per hour per foot of active element length. Okay, what we consider active element length is the actual amount of baseboard that has the aluminum fins on them. Any area of the baseboard that does not have aluminum fins connected to it is not considered an active element or an active part of the baseboard. Because remember, it's the aluminum that is what creates and generates the heat. Okay? The active element length is the length of the pipe covered, again, from the fins. The heat output is also dependent on the fluid temperature in the element. Okay, so here we have a fin to uh, a slant fin thermal rating table example. Okay, so this one here, the above ratings are based on air entering the baseboard at 65 degrees and a flow rate of either one or four gallons per minute. Okay, so if I have a, a three quarter inch uh, baseboard going through and I have a flow rate of say about a one say one gallon uh, and I want to achieve about say 120 130 degrees I need to have say 120 degrees I need to have at least 190 okay to go through Okay, these ratings are again, they are based and tested, are, are based on testings conducted by the Hydronic Institute using the IBR testing and rating code for baseball, baseboard radiation. Okay, output ratings are usually listed for average water temperature ranging anywhere from 220 to 150, 120 to 150 degrees. Okay, any output rating at water temperatures below 150 degrees must, establish, must be established using correction factors established by the testing standards. Okay, so your IBR heat output rating correction factors. So, okay, uh, average water temperature, say, of 150 degrees. The correction factor to your heat output rating of, at 150 degrees is 1. 140.84, so on and so forth. Uh, the correction factor, uh, multiply rating factors, multiply the output rating on the baseboard at 150 degree water temperature. They show how the heat output of fin tube baseboard decreases rapidly at lower water temperature. So for example, the heat output of a baseboard operating with 
100 degree average water temperature is only 28% of the heat output while operating at 150 degrees.